And we're back from the blue corner. My name is Dennis and we've got a special episode this week. But before we get onto it, I will just say, as they always say, please give it a like, share and subscribe. Um, and yeah, let's get on with it. So today's guest, um, you know, has been in the uh, combat sports field since 2009, uh, turning pro in boxing in 2012 before taking up her pro career in mixed martial arts in the year after 2013. Um, she holds the uh, IBA and WBF uh, titles for, for boxing. She is also the quickest female knockout in Bellator. And um, it has just been announced that she's probably got the biggest fight that uh, any Aussie has faced Um in fighting for the Bellator title against Chris Cyborg. Uh, I'm talking about none other than Arlene Blanco herself. How are you and how has 2020 been shaping up for you? I'm good, thanks, Dennis. Thanks for having me on. Um, no, 2020, yeah, it's been a, definitely an interesting year for everyone. You know, the world's gone crazy, um, with everything COVID. But for me, um, yeah, it's definitely been a year of um, development and hard training um we've been training it all year through covid um through the restrictions and um you know now that the gyms are open back up um knuckling right down and yeah as of last week the announcement made for this big fight with chris cyborg now i guess uh i mean we'll, we'll get on to the fight a little later but like have you the rumors were already in january that you were going to come up with this fight um the, the only thing that I kind of saw getting in the way of that is COVID, obviously, flight restrictions and, and all of that kind of uh, jazz. Um, but in the back of your mind, did you kind of know you were going to get this shot? I, and, and I mean that by – because I think the date's been set for the 15th of October, yep. uh, which is four weeks away. <laughs> um, so are you only just starting your, your fight camp now? Or, or, or have you kind of, because, you know, as I said, the rumour mill's been there for quite some time, have you already been training with this fight in mind? Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, so when the rumours, obviously Scott Coker had his announcement um, post-fight after the Chris Cyborg and Julia Budd fight earlier in the year, um, you know, it was made known that I was the number one contender and that's who they had planned. So, you know, we started straight away you know, fighting, you know, planning to, for the fight with Chris Cyborg. And in the back of our heads, we were thinking, you know, if you're planning for a fight with Chris, who is, you know, one of the best fighters um, going around, obviously up until she lost to Amanda Nunes, she was, you know, the baddest woman at featherweight um, on the planet. And um, you know, if you're training for a fight camp for her, then you're prepared for anybody under her, obviously. So, you know, it was a, always a win-win, um, you know, training for a fight like that. Um, we got word... Oh, yeah, a few months ago about, um, you know, we signed a contract. We actually signed, um, you know, for a September date, um, but it got pushed to coincide um, with their new t TV signing. So that's why we're now fighting in October. Um, but, yeah, so we've been preparing. It's been um, – obviously, back in January, I was hitting the gym hard wanting to, you know, get, prepa get prepared. But without a date, you kind of don't want to be, you know, maxing out your training. Um, you just got to sort of, you know, cruise along and, and, and wait – now let's take it back. So you, as I said in the intro, you you started um, in two thousand and nine as an amateur in in yeah. boxing. So yeah. boxing was your first sport, yeah. right? Um, why? Uh, I guess why boxing? Uh, uh, like, what, was there kind of the plan to to go com games or or the Olympics or or something like that? Like, so why um, boxing? And then I guess why transition across to mixed martial arts? Yeah, um, boxing. So um, I always I had an interest in the sport. Like I love the idea of fighting. But you know, when I was younger, sort of you know teenage years, it wasn't a normal thing to see a female in a boxing gym. So yeah, and I'd I'd watch you know all the guys fighting and stuff like that, and think oh it'd be awesome to get in there. And um, two thousand and nine, um, New South Wales lifted the ban for females to fight um, and to compete. Um, obviously that coincided with the announcement that women's boxing was introduced into the 2012 Olympics. And, yeah, that for me um, started – well, actually just resurrected a, a childhood dream of the idea of representing Australia at the Olympics. Um, I was into athletics growing up. Um, 
sprinting, you know, the 100 metre, 200 metre for both my events. And that was something that, um, you know, I'd always, I wanted to pursue that. Um, yeah, so I, I didn't obviously do that. But yeah, so when, we, when I finally f- started fighting, that was the career goal to represent Australia um, as an Olympian, uh, as a boxer. And um, yeah, that was, that was the goal originally. And is it true that uh, – because you – where did you grow up? You grew up uh, up north somewhere, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. In, in a little town. And I, I, I don't know if I read it somewhere or probably I listened to one of your other podcasts or something and you were saying that you basically left home at a very young age. Yeah, yeah. I um, I was actually 12 years old when I ran away from home. Um, you know, the the year after that it was a bit of a troubled year. Um, yeah, I just – kind of went off the rails a little bit, was skipping school, you know, um, smoking cigarettes, hanging around the wrong crowd, just, yeah, being um, obviously setting myself to, up to go down the wrong track in life. Um, I was lucky in a sense that I, um, I actually met my children's father at a young age and his family who somewhat, I guess, put me back on the right track in the sense that I, I moved back, uh, I moved in with them, started school again, like I actually finished my HSC, um, you know, I was working part-time jobs and, and for the most part, you know, stopped smoking cigarettes and, and yeah, started down the right path in life. Um, but then later on, obviously, our relationship was a very toxic one and that sort of that in turn led down the wrong path in life again. So that, you know, started a different um, story, I guess. <laughs> and, and when you, when you say... Uh toxic like was it more just I I, I guess uh, you know I mean I guess you were both y- very young right like yeah. uh, was it more like an immaturity thing or or is it something that I guess led you to I, I guess even combat sports yeah um, oh definitely that's one of the reasons that sort of got me definitely started when at 26 when we did break up but yeah the relationship was toxic I mean at 13 and 14. You can't start a relationship. I mean, you're both young adults. Like, I didn't pursue anything. I mean, God, I would have started boxing back at 13, um, you know, when I first sort of was introduced to um, the fight world. But um, I didn't pursue that. I didn't – yeah, nothing that I did in my life sort of was based on my plans. It was always plans on sort of, you know, um, what we were doing as a couple or um, – yeah. And then in turn, like, I, I was pregnant with our daughter at 17 – so, um, you know, I was a young mum at 18, so then that in turn um, completely changed the plans there. Like I had plans on going to university and, um, yeah, studying and, you know, having a career and this and that. But, yeah, I was a mum at a young age, which I would not change for the world. Um, you know, every every path that my life has taken me has led to me being in this spot today. And, um, you know, at 26 when I finally did start fighting, every training session – that I went to, I was switched on. It was not, there was no mucking around. It's like I was away from my two kids, you know, in a gym training. So I was going to make the most of it. So um, that's probably why I am such a dedicated, um, focused, switched on fighter because I still have that mentality now. I'm, if I'm going to be, you know, if I'm going to spend an hour, an hour and a half in a gym training that I could be at home with my kids, you know, doing something with my kids, then, you know, that's a pretty big, um, uh, what's the word? Um, sacrifice, that's I the guess. Word. <laughs> um, yeah, so yeah, it is a big sacrifice. So that's that's why I've got that mentality. And from what I see, obviously your eldest, uh, she's an academic. <laughs> yes. Um, yes. Which which is kind of weird because usually you got the parents that want you to follow the ac- ap- uh, academic path. Yeah. And. Um, but you being the pro athlete now, it's kind of like, you know, um, I, I mean, obviously you still want her to follow down that route, but it, it, it's just not uh, what you would consider normal, I guess, because normally it's the parent and the kid wants to play a lot of sport, and yeah, the, you know, yeah. and, 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 and the parents, they're going, no, you've got to do your homework. Um, but, yeah, like how how has that relation – like have you been able to help her with her homework or she's already – Oh, man, she's – We were. I was driving home because she lives in Wollongong now, so um, we were driving – I was dropping her back home after um, coming and staying at our house for a few days and she was reading me an assessment that she was writing for her psychology um, that she <laughs> and she was reading it to me and I'm like, I have no idea what that <laughs> – but I'm like, I can spell check it for you. Yeah, she um, she – has always been super smart, but again, that's just she hasn't. Sorry, 
she hasn't always been super smart. I remember like her early high school year, she was struggling with especially English and um, she's worked really, really hard and, yeah, now she's in the position where she is quite academic and she's, um, you know, she's going really, really well. And then on the other side is your your youngest, which is <laughs> which is your son, right? Yeah. And and he's kind of following, well, not following your footsteps in, in the sense of like he's not into combat sports, but it looks like he, he's starting to become quite the athlete. Yeah, yeah. It's so good to be able to teach him. Um, obviously, yeah, he's a soccer player and he's a goalkeeper and it's you know, a far sport from combat, but there's a lot of the lessons that I can teach him with being you know a respectable athlete and how to look after yourself and um, you know, treat your coaches, treat your teammates, the work ethic, and he sees all of that. Um, you know, he's he's literally grown up in the gym um, from, oh gosh, when I was pregnant. <laughs> when he was in my belly, he was going to a gym, so... Um, yeah, he's, he's seen the hard work, and they both have. Um, I'd like to think that, you know, um, me fighting was never about, you know, wanting them to be fighters. It's probably yeah, it's the last thing I'd want from them. Obviously, if they wanted to be a fighter, um, I'd support them 100%. But I've always said that I'd support them in whatever they choose, and as long as they can just see, you know, that hard work and dedication in anything that you want to pursue. And obviously, too, you know, the, the roller coaster of a ride, um, and they see it with both their their passions that it's never smooth sailing you just keep going and look if you can do it making uh, like playing soccer that's a good sport because <laughs> it's still one of the highest paid sports in the world globally right yeah, like it's yeah. just like it's crazy and and on that note i've seen you post the other day that um he's been accepted yeah to sydney fc yeah so what does that entail um well he's just yeah, joining their academy, so their development squad. So he's under 13s next year and, um, yeah, he'll spend the next – well, obviously if they keep him, but just, um, you know, he'll spend the next few years and hopefully then progress into the A-League team. And, I mean, even from there, there might even be overseas scouters, that which there are, always are, especially at the A-League games. And, I mean, yeah, it's it's been an interesting few weeks um, for me as a mother on and off the phone to all different coaches like he – he had op- opportunities to go to uh, several clubs across Sydney, and um, yeah, it just was spinning me out because I keep like I'm like he's a twelve year old boy, but yeah, they definitely start them young, and I can see a big future in him. It's just yeah, for my, for me, the goal with Kian was always you know to be an educated athlete and to be a respectable person too, because at the end of the day, um, how you hold yourself off the field, um, you know, plays a big big part in your career too. Um, you see it all the time with these professional athletes, you know, they're rat bags and it just, yeah, it, it's not, um, you don't want to be that sort of person. You want to be hold yourself well on the field and hold yourself even better off the field. And I guess um, on a two-part question around this kind of topic, which, which is your, which is the hardest battle, fighting professionally in a cage or parenting? <laughs> and which job do you take more serious, fighting professionally or parenting? Oh, well, parent, yeah, parenting's obviously always my number one. Um, it, I say this all the time, it doesn't matter what I do, what what else I do in my life. It could be winning world titles, you know, have, having you know all this money in my account or whatever. But, yeah, at the end of the day, what means the most to me are my children. They are my greatest achievement and they mean, like, more to me than anything. Um, but I also, in that sense, my fight career... And the things that they see um, me doing day in and day out is also teaching them great things to set themselves up in life too. Um, you know, it was one of the reasons I started fighting is that, you know, I didn't want to just be that mother. Not not that there's anything wrong with, you know, being a mum to them. I wanted them to, I wanted to be a role model and show them firsthand, not just, you know, point to people and be like, oh, I'll be like that person. Like, I just show them. So, And... Obviously, you know, that, that mother instinct comes out because I also see that you, right now, you've got the biggest fight <laughs> of your career coming up and you're still taking time to, to you, you went and visited some juvenile, um, yeah. was it just last week or the week before? Um, what's your reasoning behind, I, I, I guess, you know, and, and I guess just the timing of it. I mean, it's always good to have good role models in, in, in yeah. the community and stuff like that. But when you have such an important, I guess, bout coming up, um, you know, yeah. Why why go to I guess these juveniles? Yeah. Um, and and yeah. Why um, now as well? I guess. Yeah. Well, I ha- I have been working with them. Um, you know, for quite a few years now. But um, I've I've taken on 
a more permanent position um, with going to the juvenile centre weekly. I just, you know, touching, going back to an earlier comment, obviously, you know, at a young age I had the potential to go, you know, and live a completely different life to what I live today, but just purely from the decisions I was making at a young age and, and the people that I was hanging around. So it is a subject that's close to my heart and I think that, you know, all it takes is, um, you know, to have that one person in your life that can, you know, be that good example that might set something, um, you know, teach you something. And that's, as I said um, in one of my posts, so, you know, if I can at least just, you know, reach one person out of this group and change their life, then for me, not that I'll even know that I've changed their life, but I just know looking back, you know, at 37 now, I've had a lot of influential people in my life and, um, all it takes might, might even just be one comment from one person that's, you know, sparked a little fire inside me or, um, yeah, that's potentially led to, who like, who I am today. Um, so, yeah, that's, that is why. It's a subject close to my heart and I think, um, you know, I found my passion in life, which is obviously fighting, but then through that I found my purpose, which is, you know, to pass it on. So, um, and I think it's more in the sense... Uh, I could be a boxing coach or this and that, but I think I've got more to share through my experiences than you know, which is which is mentoring. I feel that um, you know I can help other people. And I guess most kids would like really love that, right? They're like, <laughs> like this is badass. Yeah. Um, but when when it when it comes to your kids, like how 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 do they feel about you know, mum going off to 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 like and and i'm sure sometimes you come back and you're all bruised up and yeah. stuff like do your kids um i mean earlier on they might have been a bit young but i mean they're definitely both at that age where they totally understand yeah. what's going yeah. on now so do they see it as a bad like you know like are they happy to go <laughs> mum's a fighter or or are they at a point where they're kind of like ma like I, you no. know we don't want to see you get hurt kind yeah. of thing well obviously they wouldn't want to see me get hurt but they see how much hard work i think they believe in me like, my son thinks it's pretty cool. Like, he's in high school now and, you know, he tells all his mates his mum's this and his mum's that. But for my daughter, like, she'll sit there and she's like, you know, obviously um, I told her about the cyborg fight, you know, weeks ago, like when we first found out that it was official and she's like, you know, are you scared? You know, so we have these honest conversations and that. Um, but for the most part, I think that they're just used to it now. Um, you know, I've, I've been lucky I haven't been seriously injured, you know, a couple of black eyes, this and that. Like most of my injuries actually happen, happen during fight camp rather than the fight itself. But um, they believe in me and, um, yeah, I guess they're just happy happy that I'm going for it. <laughs> and talking about um, telling all these friends at school what you do, do they still have those kind of like um, – career days or whatever where they bring parents in and and you got to tell like the class what you do for a living do they still do that um no i haven't been up to the school for that um i'll have to ask him actually but i'm sure that if they did he'd be the first one to be dragging me along so he's definitely wouldn't be the one that would be embarrassed to bring his mum up that's for sure he's um like i remember when we i went to hawaii the end of last year for uh he represented australia in futsal so, um, you know, obviously all the players and they were players from all over Australia and then their parents and, you know, I went along with him. Um, and then, you know, the kids were all playing within the space of an hour. They all knew that I was a professional fighter and then they'd told their mums and then I've got all the parents coming up to me asking, yeah, so I was literally, there was no hiding it, whereas I'm the type of person that when I'm sort of in a group of people, I don't, I prefer much, not that I'm in, embarrassed or ashamed, I just... You know, I don't walk around letting people know who I am or what I do and fighting wise. So I wouldn't have even told them, but they knew. <laughs> Thanks to Kian. <laughs> and for people that don't know, futsal's like a miniature version oh, of yeah. soccer. Yeah. Um, I think it's five on five or something. Yeah, Usually yeah, it's, it's indoors, in, indoor, right? Yeah, smaller goals. It's on um, like a hard, like a netball, basketball type um, court. So it's a fast paced game. Um, but yeah, so. It's funny because I played two games. I had, a, I had a friend invite me along. They're like, oh yeah, come, it'll be fun. I think I learned I had two left feet that day. <laughs> like I, I really like – and like I used to play basketball, so my coordination is pretty good. Yeah. But, um, yeah, it is a different game. Yeah. It really is. Um, so I guess um, only because you did start, I guess, later on to what most of these kids are starting these days, right? Like um, you were 25? 26. 26, fight, yeah. right? Um, where a lot of these kids now are starting, you know, in their teens. Yeah. Um, you know, lo- looking back on it now, like if there was – knowing what you know now, what would you give 
and especially knowing that you were going down the wrong track and, um, you know, as you say, people walk into your life and they inspire you or whatever. But yep. if you were to, you know, how they always sometimes say, like, write a letter to your yeah, youngest yeah. self or whatever. If you were to, like, give your younger self advice now, knowing what you know now, yep. what what would... Well, it's funny because when you, when you are younger, you think that the future is so far ahead. Like, you know, even, you know, as a 12, 13-year-old, the idea of, you know, thinking of me at 37, I'm like, oh, wow, that's so old. But... When you think about the years, do go by really, really quickly. Like, it just feels like yesterday that I was a teenager, sort of thing. But it, yeah, for me, and this is what I was sort of saying in my mentoring groups too. Like, make smart, smart choices for your life. You know, th- think of the future. Think, think big picture too. Set yourself goals and and don't ever think that you can't achieve them. So for me, you know, I was you know a young child, and my dream was to reach you know be an Olympian as an athlete um, in athletics. Sorry, and but I just never really thought that I could do that. But there was no reason why I couldn't. Like, why didn't I just, you know, pursue athletics and, you know, train and work hard? Instead, I just thought that, no, nah, that's not, like, I can't do it. I wouldn't be able to do it. You know, find a way to, don't let anyone ever dim your light um, with your goals. Like, I always used to think that I could do great things, but never really sort of put myself in a position to do it. Um, but then also, too, like myself, obviously, if you make mistakes in life, don't think that that's a be all and end all. There's absolutely no reason at any stage of your life, you know, being a child, teenager, young adult life, late adult life, you know, whether it's in relationship, careers, your personal life. If you've made mistakes or you're in a you know, bad situation, you're in a rut, especially here in Australia, we're in such a lucky situation where you can change things. Um, you know, even if you're out, you know, homeless, living on the streets, but there's ways that you can make, you know, change your life and, and turn it around for the better. And I've I've got my theory about like you know it's exactly what you said like um, age and and time seems so far away as you're younger and I always say it's 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 just relevance right so obviously when when you're five years old one year is one fifth of your life right yeah, yeah. so you know once you're twenty it's one twentieth of your life yeah. so e- each year becomes a smaller proportion I mean, and and that's why I feel like the years as you get older yeah right. Um, start going quicker because I remember the same thing I remember going through school and you know even like just high school going from year six to year 12 yeah that felt like eternity <laughs> right and 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 now you look at it and you're like well I've done that like four times over I know. right and yeah. it only feels like I left school two years ago yeah. yet yet yeah. you know so I totally um appreciate that that kind of yeah. you know scope of things um I guess though as well with 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 the age though is how how long do you see yourself still going I mean you started late so and sometimes that can help because obviously you don't take that early uh, damage as you're developing yeah um, but I mean you know I always say <laughs> especially in this sport like age does play a factor because you know certain sports you can go basketball Andrew Gaze yeah. played till he was 50. Um, I mean, look, Couture fought till he was 48, don't get me wrong. Um, but I always say, you know, youth is a big factor in this sport because of reaction time, yeah. uh, speed, recovery Just time. Just your body coming through fight camps too. But, yeah, I mean, the idea of Mike Tyson making comebacks promising for me. But, um, no, I, I t- totally get you too. And for me, um, like and I've said it a long time, and that's probably why I am so proactive with setting life up after fighting because I think, unfortunately, for me, the spark and the love and the desire will still be there long after my body tells me it's not time, to, like it's time to stop. Um, I'm lucky in a sense, like I said, I'm setting myself up now so that I've got an interest still in the sport um, where I can very much still be a part of it. Um, and then, yeah, I've got, I've got a great personal life too. Like my partner and I have got plans as well. So, yeah, I feel one of the biggest focuses I've had and I've had for a long time and it's probably because I've been surrounded by athletes um, and seen firsthand what it's like to be on the spot, like being you know, under the bright lights and then the next day um, your career can be over and having to deal with that. So, you know, I've always had myself in a situation where, you know, if my career was all of a sudden over, I'd have things to fall back onto to help that um, the mental side of it. Because yeah. So is that like in a more in like investments, or uh, are you talking about more like a plan? Like you know, I know a lot of um, athletes they'll start a gym, 
you know, and start yeah. coaching? Like, are, are we talking more setting yourself up in that sort of direction or is it like personal investments that you've made that will hold you through afterwards? Oh, no, no, no. Yeah, no, like little goals. Um, yeah, so things to do after fighting. So I wouldn't be setting up a gym. That would probably be the last thing <laughs> on my mind. But definitely um, mentoring fighters, managing fighters, um, you know, running a lot of seminars, doing my motivational talking, uh, the mentoring the youth, um, running active kid programs. So, yeah, there's a lot and I've, I can't wait for this um, – obviously this fight to happen but the two-week quarantine when I'm back here in Australia I need that two weeks in front of my laptop just to start putting things into um into play like even for my partner too like he's a soccer current like he's a soccer player as well and he's actually someone that I've learned a lot of um so going back to the story where you can know you're playing under the bright lights and you know, performing under the bright lights and literally the next day your career is over um that happened to him so to have that like you know that support from my partner um over the last few years has really helped me in um, pivotal points of my career where, you know, I've potentially been thinking about retiring and, you know, focusing on other things and, you know, even having him sort of sit there and say to me, like, babe, especially at your age now, if you retire, that's, that's it. You can't decide to come back in 12 months' time or a year's time. Like, if you retire now, it's – you're done. Like, are you ready to end your career? And I was lucky that I had that support, especially from, you know, a partner as well because – uh, let's face it, being a par- like a, a partner to a female fighter is not the, <laughs> the easiest um, role. So he could have very easily been selfish in that um, instance, and but he wasn't. He was supportive, and and I'm here today because of him. <laughs> and and when you say like it happened to him, like mm. what what were the circumstances around that? Was was it like injury that that pulled it out from him, or yeah, well a bit of both. So he was actually um, <laughs> funny enough. So my son's a goalkeeper for soccer, and he's a goalkeeper for soccer as well. So. Um, so Kian's very, very lucky that he's obviously got okay, me. Okay, so on that though, who's the favourite parent then? <laughs> um, Mummy's always a favourite. <laughs> Fair play. <laughs> um, no, but he, yeah, so he, he, Kian's got a lot of support in the sense that he's got a, a stepfather that's, um, you know, reached the top level in Australia in the sport and the position that he's um, now playing in. So, And then obviously me as a mother – and then us as parents too, like, yeah, we still try and keep him very grounded. But um, going back to the question with Dion, he um, – so he was playing for Newcastle Jets, the A-League team, and, um, yeah, had a shoulder reconstruction. And then, yeah, it was a mixture of injury and then he had a bad manager at the time too. So, yeah, it was like overnight, um, yeah, f- phone calls, this and that, and then, yeah, his career, his um, you know, contract was terminated and he was – yeah, but for him – nothing was sort of set up in place for life. Well, he was only young at the time too, so you kind of don't think about those things. And so, yeah, he actually, you know, spiralled downhill, went through depression and this and that, obviously still getting over injury. And, um, yeah, so it was a tough time for him. So he shared that knowledge with me, which has helped me a lot in my career. So No, and, and I mean, the, the other thing on that is like, you know, uh, uh, regardless of what sport it is, generally speaking, is like you do have a limited life lifespan yep. right like and um i find it's the same thing a lot of the athletes that come through once again start at a young age right whether yep. it's athletics um even now in the football and stuff they they start you know in their teens um and i think that's also problematic sometimes as well because you don't have a life coach yep right so um for instance when you hear about you know uh some of these nrl players <laughs> or whatever and they get into a bit of trouble yep. or and I go, it doesn't surprise me because once again, like going back to, you know, when you're young, you think you've got so much time in front of you. As you get older, you you realise it's not really there. But yeah. like the other thing is like when you're young and you sign, I don't know, a couple of hundred thousand dollar yeah. contract, right? It's a lot of money for yeah, a kid. For sure. Definitely. Right? And, and a lot of them don't know what to do with that money. And yeah. then on top of that is you don't live the normal lifestyle where it's a nine to five Monday to Friday. You do two hours of practice, then you have this whole time where you've got nothing to do. Yeah. And, and so I think it's like a dangerous combination because you're, you're young and let's let's say a little bit silly. Yep. You've got a lot of money and a lot of time on your hands. And I, and I just yeah, think, you know, right, it's, it's right. And, and, and especially even more so in the States when you when you hear about the, these say basketballers who forget a couple of hundred thousand or NFL and they're making millions. Especially when you look at, yeah, I guess some of the family upbringings, they come from absolutely nothing and then all of a sudden they have everything. They've got the fame, they've got the money, 
they've got all this attention on them. Like, yeah, you can't help but to go to their head. And, um, yeah, so that's that's one of my biggest focuses with Kian because, um, like, I, you see it all the time. So that's why, like I said before, I try to keep him, you know, um, level-headed on the field but then same outside and off the field. And um, for me, and I've drummed it into him since an early age, is that you want to be an educated athlete so that, you know, if touch wood that his career was to end early – like he's a good-looking kid with a good head on his shoulders. So there's so many other avenues. Like if you can't play soccer, there's so much else to do in the world of soccer that can you can make a name for yourself or still be involved. And the same with me with fighting. You know, if once I'm finished fighting, I might not be in the cage fighting, but I still have a very, very strong tie to Bellator. Um, you know, there's promotions that I want to hold here in Australia and like an all-women's fight promotion. Um, yeah, like an Evicta? Yeah, yeah, but um, it'll be Amazonia. So it'll kind of like hopefully run off um, – like there's Gladiators MMA, which is obviously Tama Tahuna's um, fight promotion that he runs at the band club. So, yeah, I'll kind of sort of run off that in the Western Sydney area and then, yeah, have fly fighters over from – yeah, really focus on the Southern Hemisphere and then, yeah, try and be a feeder club feeder um, promotion to Bellator and then keep that really close tie. And I, and I did ask Janae and I did ask Ty, when are we bringing Bellator to Australia? <laughs> Like, is that something that you? I mean, definitely. If you beat Chris, when I beat Chris? Oh yeah, when? Sorry, <laughs> no. Grant, granted, granted. Um, are you going to get into Scott's ear and go? Now it's time to bring yeah, Bellator definitely. to Australia because because yeah. look, I I have to say like that the market is here yeah. and I and I think Bellator would do great and I just. I always feel like we kind of miss out, right? Well, like, man, if they're running shows, you know, in Europe and. You know, um, they've done the Asian market too. And, the, yeah, there's no reason they can't bring it here. I think with having, obviously, um, I'd really like to try and get some um, Australian guys signed to the promotion too. So that's something. But, yeah, I'll win this fight and it definitely um, opens up a big – I like, yeah, I need to win this fight so I can sort of put in place many other little plans I have, um, which is definitely bringing Bellator to Australia um, – you know, there's a few other people in the roster. Obviously, we've got Janae, we've got Beck Rawlings, um, you know, Ty from New Zealand. But, yeah, there's definitely so much potential. Even, you know, the gyms that I train in here in Western Sydney and even down in Wollongong, like I look around and think, gosh, there's so much talent and everyone's thinking UFC, UFC, everyone wants to get there. But, you know, Bellator is an awesome promotion. You get signed to there and they do look after you, um, which is the very reason why I haven't gone over to the UFC. Well, and, and the show's different. Like... Um I, I really like the Bellator show. Like, I've been to a couple of live events, right, and I just – I I don't know who I was saying it to. I really like the show that they put on with the yeah. with the big screens, the walkway that you guys walk down and yeah. stuff. Like, it's it's um, a full-on production, and, and yeah. I just think, you know, it is totally different. And that's why I, I find it funny when people are always like UFC Bellator, and it's like, to be honest with you, you're both in the mixed martial arts business, 100%, yeah. but I think you both have your different take on it as well. Like, I, I don't think you're actually, like, competing, competing with each other. I think, you know, they're, they're two different models on the way that they run their organisations. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I'll always, um, you know, have a soft spot for Bellator because my early days, you know, they saw something in, they, in me. They, did, they weren't worried about records. My, like my record was five wins, four losses. And that's purely because I was learning on the trot. Like, I didn't have any amateur MMA fights. So, you know, would learn from fight to fight. And in that first year, I had some ridiculous amount of fights um, for a one-year period where there's not really much time to learn. But in saying that, like, I you know, was learning as much as I could. But, um, yeah, they believed in me. They worked with me, you know, and, um, you know, they respect me and they've um, definitely looked after me in the five years that I've been signed with them. And so when did you know you could make a career out of this. And I only say this because you pretty much came in, I won't say before, it was pretty much the same year as the Ronda Rousey effect, right? So right now, like, obviously, women's MMA is definitely up there. You know, you, sure. you, you've you got a lot of high, uh, I mean, whether it be Cyborg, whether it be Nunes, whether it be, um, you know, Joanna. Yeah. Um, but it all sort of started with, uh, yeah. With Ronda, yeah, for sure. um, and and obviously, um, you know, now you see a lot of these gyms. Uh, I deal a lot to do with the Wimp to Warrior program, uh, which is obviously getting amateurs or people with no experience in, and and they do this six month fight camp yeah. and, and and get to have a fight at the end. And their numbers are literally fifty fifty now, like male to female, yeah. if not sometimes even 
a little more female than than male. Yeah. But when you awesome. started, there was no Ronda Rousey yet. Or she she I think she started 2012 as well. So yeah. she was there, but I'm saying the the Ronda Rousey effect hadn't taken yeah. taken hold yet. So when did you realize I guess you could make a career out of this? Um Well, it's funny cuz I um I literally started MMA to keep so well, I actually started doing wrestling training and jiu-jitsu just to mix up my boxing training cuz yeah, um when I turned professional, my first three fights had happened, but then it was just this long st- – and there was a long period of time between each of the fights too, um, whereas I'd come from being an amateur where you'd fight, you know, every second weekend or you'd go up to tournaments and you'd potentially fight three times in one week of the Friday, the Saturday, you know, make the finals fight Sunday. So I was very active, you know, a lot of exhibition fights or this and that. So, you know, in a one-year period you can have a heap of fights, whereas as a professional, um, you know, you only have one – maybe, you know, one or two fights if you're lucky sort of thing. So I think it had been about 10 months in between um, fight number one and two and I was like, oh, well, all this training. So, yeah, my coach at the time was like, you know, why don't you mix things up? And I looked at wrestling and BJJ and I was like, well, that's way too confronting. Like it for me, I I didn't like it being inside even boxing close, um, you know, the wrestling and the you know, dirty boxing, the phone booth fighting and stuff like that. Like I was a long-range fighter. Um in and out um yeah so the idea of that I didn't like it at all but he's like it's all right it's you know because at the time I only had um, one training partner and my coach and he's like well it's just us we train together so it's not like you'd be walking into a gym and training with someone you don't know so you know obviously a lot of confronting positions for somebody new to the sport whereas now you know I'll literally walk into any gym you know you know tap in and then do a round and and not even like think anything of it you know you don't you don't even know the person you don't even know their name and at the end of it you say thank them and introduce yourself or whatever but you know at the beginning um you know for an outsider looking in on the sport it's um (laughs) it's a bit crazy but um so yeah I started it and you know had the um you know first 14 months worth of fighting I got signed to Bellator and even then like flying over there I was still taking MMA as a side sport so Um, It wasn't until I won that first fight on Bellator and, um, you know, obviously got paid a lot more money than I'd ever made in any of my professional career, um, which still wasn't a lot back then anyway. But compared to like, uh, I mean, I remember one of the fight promotions here in Australia, I fought three times in one night on a a gauntlet type um, thing and and I made $100 and my parking back at Sydney Airport was 170 So I was actually in the minus after that. And Which is crazy, right? That is, yeah. it, it's just, and, and I get it too. Like the, the the problem is, is like the money's not here on the local scene, and that's it. Like you know, it, promotions rely on ticket sales and this and that. And yeah, and this is something that I was talking um, on another podcast earlier in the week. Is that you can't go into this sport like I, you know, even now I still work a full time job and I've got other side things with my mentoring, coaching, this and that for income. But that's purely because. Um, I'm trying to get ahead in life, you know, with my kids. You know, I was I'm not going to rely on going fight to fight and provide for my family in that sense, um, and that's why I still, you know, juggle working in that. But so, what do you do for work? I work for Coca Cola. I do quality assurance. Um, so, so what you sit there and and, and you drink a lot of co- <laughs> you drink a lot of Coke on a daily basis. <laughs> so, um, post mix accounts. So, like, I literally, you know, visit clubs, pubs, um, and restaurants, and that, and. Yeah, do quality assurance for their post mix accounts. But one of the quality assurance tests is to taste test it. But um, I hope my boss isn't listening. I don't taste test all of it. I'll do the no sugar cake. <laughs> well, surely they got to understand, right? Like, uh, I mean, because it, it's definitely not. Man, the, the if you taste test, if you saw how many like venues I go to, and it, yeah, there's a lot of taste testing. <laughs> but I mean, for the most part, when you do all the other tests, and if they come back good, then generally the taste is good, anyways. <laughs> <laughs> and in a case like this, like, do you get time off from them, or, yeah. or do you still only get like your four four weeks annual leave no, a year? Well, I've actually been really lucky in the sense that, um, so my last three fights, you know, I, um, I've been working the whole time through fight camp, and I just take my time off. And and for me, it was one of those like you know high five, you know fist pump moments. The fact that I've juggled, you know, working a full time job, you know looking after the kids, I coach classes at um, the gym, our kids' classes and boxing and boot camps, um, my mentoring. Like, I've got a crazy schedule. But um, this fight camp, obviously, for the biggest fight of my career, I don't want to, you know, sit back and think I should have taken some time off. So, yeah, I've taken time off work. Um, 
And as of this week, I've actually taken um, the next three weeks off um, my coaching responsibilities too. Um, so, yeah, I, I feel like I hate letting people down, but in saying that too, I know that everyone's super understanding. It's just, um, yeah, just head down, bum up. Well, when it comes <laughs> to just even MMA in this country, like it's the biggest female fight right now, right? 100%. Like it, it, it just is. So, like, I mean, you kind of have to take that that time off. And, and you know, they always say that mixed martial arts is a selfish sport. Yeah. And I guess that brings us to the next thing as well, which is like, do you shut out? say your kids and stuff now as well and put that on to your partner that he's got it or do you still make time for them like because at what point do you just go look because they they say like it's a sport that you have to be obsessive yeah and you know sometimes and that's why you see like a lot of these martial artists you know whether it be with relationships with partners or in in, in your case kids as well like sometimes you've got to take that selfish stance yeah. and you're like you know what I'm not trying to be a bad partner. I'm not trying to be a bad parent. Yeah. But no. this is all about me right now for the next, as you say, it's three weeks or whatever. So, how how is the household coping right now? Is is <laughs> I'm very very lucky that um, you know my partner and kids are all very understanding for the most part. Um, I like to switch off when I get home. I switch off from being a fighter, like I am to them. You know, a partner and a mother, and um, but in saying that, yeah, like I, I'm lucky. My partner's taken on a big role in. You know, at the moment I, um, I'm eating meals from Athletes Nutrition, which is supplied meals, and so I don't have to eat. Like, so I just literally heat up my meal. So he's taken over all, like, the responsibilities of cooking. So he does his own cooking and, and obviously working with the kids too. So they'll have their meal and, you know, I'll have my heated up meal. So um, that's just an extra strain off me, off me. I'm not sitting there, you know, cooking and I'll clean and that. But, um, yeah, I still... I still like my house duties though, like, you know, I'm still ironing and cleaning and mopping floors and this and that, but that's my, you know, switch off mode that makes me still feel normal because if you surround yourself with, um, you know, fighting so much, like, and live and breathe it, like, it does get a bit much. I like the idea of, you know, getting home and switching off and, you know, my partner and I'll jump into bed of an evening and we'll watch, you know, whatever TV series we're watching and I'm still very much a partner. But, you yeah, know, fighting does take up a lot of time, like, um, you know, after training I'll get home and, you know, if I'm, you know, got a bit of a niggly ache or something, he'll obviously, you know, rub me down and, and yeah, like they are all, it's a team thing. So when, you know, when I win, we win. Um, when I lose, yeah, we, like, yeah, they all, they're there. We're a team. And I just got to take it back to your original, like right, right at the beginning. I read somewhere that you had nine fights in the first year, year and a half. Is that correct or, or was I reading something wrong yeah, there? Yeah, no, that's what um, – so, yeah, April 2013 I had my first um, MMA fight and then May I had my second and then in June I – that's when I won my two Boxing World titles because I was actually in fight camp for my third MMA fight, which I came back and did that in the July – then I fought in August, which was the three times in the one night. And then I came back and fought, I think it was that September or October. But yeah, in a 12 month period, I'd had like obviously my boxing world title fight. And then I think my first eight professional MMA fights, which was, um, yeah, I think I was about four and four though. So, <laughs> but in saying that, like when you think about it, there was, um, you know, good reason why I've got a few losses to my name because you kind of don't really have a lot of time to fix some errors. But it's just crazy as well to be that active. I mean, you know, people always made this this big deal about, say, Cowboy Cerrone, right, that he took four, uh, five fights in, in a 12-month tw- uh, period. Yeah. And then, like, you hear that kind of stuff and you're like, as I say, I didn't even know it was uh, legal in the sense I always thought that they would hand down medical suspensions, but I guess yeah. that's probably different well, on the local scene. Yeah, 100%. That's, yeah, because it was here in Australia and... Um yeah, I was just lucky. Like I said, that was the reason why I started MMA was just to keep active. So I was loving being that active. And when you go from the amateur boxing like world where you're competing regularly like that, to me it didn't seem anything different. But now that I'm like, you know, further on in my career, I was like, wow, that is a lot of fights. Um, but yeah, no, it was cool. I was glad to be um, active and like, even looking at my record back then. And you know, I haven't lost now since 2017. And really, the only losses I've had. Um, on the world stage have been to, you know, two very top-level fighters. And obviously now we're at this 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 big fight, right? So who who have you got in your corner for this one? Is it obviously James Tahuna? Yep. Yep. Like he, he's been with you for a while now, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, 
And is it, are you taking your partner across as well? Yeah. or Or – because I know you've done a, a little bit at uh, Jackson's. Yeah, so I'm hoping Coach Wink will be there as well. Um, so he's actually cornered my last couple of fights as well. He um, has been there because he's had other fighters on the card. But, yeah, so I've done a lot – I actually spent March, uh, like, like a bit of time in March over at Jackson's and was training. And the plan originally was to go over there and do fight camp um, over there, but it's been really, really hard because we were sort of – unsure if the fight was on like even when I was there in March um COVID really kicked off and that's when um everyone was sort of told to return to Australia immediately the borders were going to be shut like it was all very up in the air and I was like oh maybe I'll just stay over here and I could just keep training but now it's funny because like <laughs> if I had stayed over there I would have been still there from March and having the kids um you know obviously ch- you know changes your thought pl- process if I didn't have a family I probably could have stayed over there and yeah, it would have been training, it would have been fine. But um, I came home and um, did my quarantine and it's been really hard to sort of plan what we were doing because, again, COVID sort of changed things. It wasn't like we were told, oh, you, yep, you'll definitely be fighting in September or, you know, October and then we could plan it from there. Obviously, the travel exemptions were another thing that we had to apply for. And, yeah, so it did change things up, but um, I'm super happy with where I am at the moment and training um, and the people that I get to train with. Well, you've also been training with Alex, right? Yeah. I saw that yeah. as well. So are you doing some of your camp with the freestyle guys? Yeah, or? yeah. Well, for me, um, the last few camps have been about trying to build a really good female team and I do have a really um, strong group of females that are featherweights to train with and, you know, um, use their bodies and, and, and train with. But obviously this fight changes things a little bit um, and in no disrespect to, to Chris by saying this, but, you know, she's as strong as a man and she, you know, I feel like... I need to be wrestling and training with guys just for that strength. So, um, yeah, I've actually, gosh, down at Freestyle, and I only said this, um, you know, I was down there last Saturday for sparring as well, like looking around the room, there was, you know, 20 different guys all at featherweight and lightweight and their skill level, they all have such different skill level but it's at high, like at a high level. So, um, you know, I can get thrown in with any one of them and then obviously even having Alex it's himself in front of me, it's like you can't get much better than that. He's the UFC featherweight world champion. So, you know, you, that's just the best of the best there. Crazy. And um, with with this fight, like obviously, and, and once again going with the age, like once once you beat her, yep. are you going to give her the rematch? Are you, are you going to defend it or are you, are you going to like uh, do a George St. Pierre and, and, and uh, like – I guess, like, I'm not trying to call a, a quits on you on your career either, yeah. but have you have you given that I'd any on a high? Yeah, have you given that any thought? Like, because obviously that'll be the uh, top oh, of the sure. top well, of the mountain, right? Yeah, like, and I said to you um, off air, you know, I first saw Chris fight, um, you know, uh, I think it was like exactly a week before my debut MMA fight back in 2013. So she's always been the girl that I'm like, you know, I want to fight her and. You know, it would have been much the same if I was a bantamweight fighter. Everyone and everyone keeps saying, "Now, when are we, when are you going to fight Ronda Rousey?" And I'm like, clearly, you don't watch a sport because she's <laughs> not even fighting anymore. But you know, back in my early days, it was like, "When are you going to fight Ronda?" But for me, it was always, "When are you going to fight Chris?" So that you know, she's the girl that's been at the top of the ranks my whole like my whole career, and she is a pinnacle fighter. And I'm super like I'm sitting here at the moment thinking I'm super lucky because you know, for a lot of fighters, they never get the chance to fight that dream fight at the you know the number one at the top. So. Yeah, for me now, you know, um, finally all these years later, our paths are crossing at the right time. And, you know, this fight in itself, and I was only saying it to Tony um, after training this morning, this fight, when I win it, will wrap up four career goals in one fight. So that's like, that's massive to sit there and be able to say that. But um, to answer your question, no, we've, um, I've got like a, a bit of a plan. So yeah, I'd like to defend it, definitely. Um, I don't, I don't want to just be that champion. Um, and sort of end it there. Um, yeah, I've definitely got two more fights um, that I want. And then I've got a few personal things that I want to do that might see me out for a little bit, but then you'll see me back. <laughs> but, yeah, definitely. Um, so what are the what are the four goals? <laughs> you say that this one fight is four goals in the yep. one fight. What, what are those four goals? Um, well, goal one, to fight Chris Cyborg. Um, goal two, to win the Bellator World title. Goal three, to earn a significant paycheck. Um, and goal four is to become a dual boxing and um, mixed MMA world champion. So that's the four goals in one. Crazy. And, and I guess, I mean, look, 
when people are saying fight Ronda or whatever, I think this is a better fight for you. I mean, look. Oh, 100%. Chris is a scary, scary fighter. Don't yep. get me wrong, but I, I, I think just watching your fights, I mean, and, and I guess this is your boxing background, is you like to stand, stand and, and bang. And yep. you know Chris... Oh, likes man. to likes to trade as well, where you know Ronda's first attempt would be like to take you down, job. right? Yeah. So, I think in that sense, it's actually a better fight for you. Oh, definitely. Um, in saying that, like, there's you know talk that Chris is wanting to get her first submission victory, which I was actually surprised that she hasn't had a submission victory in, throughout her career. But that's because her first instinct is just to stand and bang, and I'm like that too. I'd if I've got top position, it's a, like you know good submission position i wouldn't give up that you know for the submission i definitely still want to like strike it's just i think when you've got that killer instinct and i can see that she's got that um just like when she gets hit you know she wants to hit back it's like um you know you watch the nunez fight look at her there she was just swinging because she's just got like she was getting tagged but it was just her nature to want to keep returning and that's uh, um you know did you take anything away from that nunez fight like is there something that you saw in that fight that you're like Oh yeah, I definitely took a few things, and I like I said it for years that people just needed to do exactly what Amanda did was stand and fight her. Like, don't get me wrong, she of course she's a scary person, and, and her presence in the cage, and you've got someone coming forward. But if you show that fear to her, she feeds off that, and Amanda didn't. She stood there, and you know she gained respect. But in saying that, they both were swinging. Like it could have, you know, you re- repeat that exact same fight again, and it could have ended completely different. And it's unfortunate that the two of them didn't get a rematch. Um, but obviously, yeah, that's um, the UFC's loss and Bellator's gain and my gain. And um, I'm just super glad that the fight's happening and I got to stay with Bellator and, and yeah, things aligned in my in my favour, I believe. And you did mention that once you win the belt, um, you wanted another couple of fights um, and you've got a couple of fights in mind. Yeah. We, what fights are that? If you don't, are, are they obviously avenging your losses? Um, yeah. Oh, well, there's actually probably more than a couple. It's going to be a busy twelve months. But um, so with Chris, um, yeah, definitely beat her, and the idea of a rematch would be awesome. Because um, yeah, I mean, I think that she'd want that. Um, the other Bellator fight that I really want would definitely be with Julia Budd. Um, I feel like there's unfinished business there. Like I'll definitely give her the first one. That was a, a win. Um, you know, I had. Go, things going on injury wise, so for me, I was it was a win for me to be even get in there um, and step inside the cage. I've never pulled out of a fight due to injury, even even though there've been significant injuries and in that. But for me, it's something that I hold my head high, knowing that you know I get in there and um and perform, and I don't pull out an opponent. But the second one, um, yeah, it was very very close, and I should have should have left it all in the cage. Um, so lesson learned the hard way. But yeah, a third fight would be cool. But um. The other big one that I'd like to sort of push and promote would be um, a trilogy fight with Chris Cyborg, as in, um, you know, she's made it very well known that she wants to have a boxing fight, um, you know, and promote and push the, go down the avenue of being a professional boxer. So, you know, get in there and have an MMA fight with her with Bellator, have a, um, a professional boxing fight with her and also have a professional kickboxing fight with her and obviously use the, the Bellator promotion in that sense, but yeah, there's been no other athlete um, on the combat side that's fought professionally um, in all three um, sports. Well, that that could kind of work too. It could yep. go, uh, you know, have this title fight, have a boxing fight, and then have yep. the the rematch. And the reason I say that, I think on the on the weekend, Scott was talking about it. He got questioned about uh, Cyborg wanting to box, and yep. he said, "Look, I'm." Um, I'm happy for her to go down that route. The only yep. condition he asks is that whoever she boxes then steps into the MMA arena. So <laughs> it would be kind of funny if, if, if the two of yeah. you uh, got to square off in the uh, squared circle. Yeah, for sure. And obviously that's um, – I've got a lot of unfinished business in the boxing ring. Um, so, yeah, obviously having a fight with her would be really cool. Nice. And um, – I guess, you know, um, just talking about where, where you're saying um, uh, before uh, about coming home and, and switching off and, and obviously what how, how hard is it to sometimes switch off? Uh, this, this will kind of be my last sort of uh, topic just mentally because I know a lot of people always talk about like the fight game being a mental side. Um, yeah. So how hard is it? And, and even like last week I had Ty on there and he said in, in his first Bellator fight he couldn't switch on. Yeah. So... How hard is it for you to, I guess, 
switch off, um, you know, uh, after you leave the gym and everything. And yep. and also, I guess in, in, in Ty's case, how hard is it for you to say come fight night or fight week? How hard is it for you to, to get in? Like, what, is there certain things you do? Like, is there um, music that you listen to that, that gets you in the right space yep. or, or, you know, uh, you know, do you go get yourself pampered or <laughs> what, what, what is it that you do? Um, as for the switching off, um, yeah, the last few years I've spent a lot of time on working on like my mental state. Um, and for me, it's like, yeah, if I finish at the gym and I know that I put 100% in every training session, it's, you know, you take faith in the fact that you've done that. So there's no point in sitting there, you know, thinking I'll spend a few minutes after training on things, you know, working on thinking about things that I could have done better especially in an aspiring session or things that, um, you know, I was happy with. So there's – in any training session, especially when it's sparring, um, you know, take three things that you could have done better and then three things that you're happy with and always finish it on, like, the good note because otherwise you just, you know, you dwell on it. And for the most part I do that um, – God, I do that without even sort of thinking about it now and then, yeah, the session's done, you know. And, like, in training – and I say this to a lot of my training partners or people that I'm mentoring that – um, you can have like a you know a week of training sessions where every training session feels like shit. God, sometimes I even had a two week trot um, a couple of months ago, and I'm like, oh god, this is yeah, really this really sucks. It feels horrible, but you just know. And I've been doing this long enough now to know that you just got to ride the wave with that, and then eventually, like yeah, obviously your fitness picks up, or even like your recovery, or whatever the reason might be the sessions get better or like, you know, you might, yeah, you might have one really good session. And so then when you do get that good session, you kind of reward yourself and you take on, like take that on board and um, yeah, you don't dwell on the bad stuff. But that's why I always push through the bad times too, because when it comes to fight time and you might wake up and you might have a headache or you might just not feel, and I've done it before, you know, I've been a bit jet lagged and I'm tired and like before my um, Amanda fight, the one, the one that I've actually got the record for the 22 seconds, I did not want to go out there. I could have told you there. Well, that's been... why you finished it quickly, right? <laughs> well, the, yeah. The funny thing is, though, I hadn't even switched on. Like that was just a reaction. She came forward. She actually hit me with the jab, and I just came back with a you know straight right left hook, and then she just sort of dropped. It. I was like, oh shit! And then you know I went in and instantly that kill mode like you know switched on, and you know the fight was finished. But I sort of went back afterwards, and it was like, oh, and that's probably another reason I sort of was all a bit shocked by it all. Everyone's just like, you know, 22 seconds and it was great and obviously I'm very, very happy by it. But for me, I was more so focused on how I felt before that fight. That's that's the thing that I was trying to work out, um, obviously, because, yeah, it's a big thing going out there and you're not wanting to perform or even wanting to be there. It's a, so for the most part, you kind of feel like that for most of your training sessions too, especially if you're tired or sore. You don't want to get up at 5 o'clock in the morning and get to the gym, but you do it because that's what helps you come fight time because you know that you've done it a hundred times in fight camp and you just get out there and you just do it and you know what for the most part usually those training sessions are the best ones that you drag yourself to that you don't feel like going to because you've got no expectations for that training session um so yeah and and recovery has that um become a little harder as you get older because i mean i used to always say you know like when i was young I get like a little injury or whatever, I'd be able to play through it or whatever. <laughs> where now it, it, it kind of Hangs like around. so it, it, it like has that has that changed over time and um Oh definitely. And you know, is there <laughs> is there certain things now that you do like do you give yourself more recovery days or like is there certain things that you do to help with the re- yeah. recovery? Um this is like obviously a conversation that Jamie and I have a lot because he's um he's a year older than me, so he's you know, um, not fighting anymore, but he's still very, very active. But, you know, he's feeling a lot of the aches and pains from his fight career that are coming back to haunt him a little bit now. But, yeah, I've been saying it. So, yeah, I've been doing this for almost 12 years and I don't think I ever had a recovery. And I don't even think I used to have rest days back when I first started because I was just that hungry. I just wanted to train all the time. And, um, yeah, whereas now there's a very, very strict training week and I'm, for the most part, probably doing – 70-30 70-30 like with training and recovery so like yeah if it, I'm doing recovery every single day whether it be you know seeing my physio, chiro, cryo, hyperbaric, um, remedial massage, acupuncture, um, Normatec boots, rolling yeah like it's a very very um, and it's not so much because I need it it's just that um, yeah that prof- professional side of things like your body isn't a robot like it's um, and yeah having a, tr- a strict training 
um, schedule where I have the rest days and even listening to my body now too. So, you know, it might get to a Wednesday and um, I've got um, like a Wednesday plan, but two of the sessions could potentially be cut out if my body is needing it from the Monday, Tuesday, which is quite strenuous so that, um, you know, it's that midweek sort of hump day where you, you know, a little bit fatigued and same thing comes through to sparring on the Saturday, like the Friday night, that's a, a question mark session too, so that I'm, you know, if I'm not feeling it, um, then I can be a little bit fresher on the Saturday. But it's a bit of a trial and error because there's also, like for me, I'm one of those people that just want to train hard all the time. So because I'm like that, I have the luxury of, you know, having the rest days in a sense because, you know, some people could take it the other way, whereas if you're missing sessions, you're being lazy and this and that. But, yeah, I, I know to listen to my body. And it's also trying to make sure that you peak at the right oh, for sure. right time, right? Yeah. Like that, that is really important. Um, just because I'm looking at it in, 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 on your background, anger fist, where does that come from? Because <laughs> you don't seem the angry type. No. I mean, you, 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 fight, you fight a very, uh, you know, uh, aggressive fight style, um, yeah. especially with your jabs and stuff like you, you come for it quite, quite, you know, as I say, yeah, aggressively. But <laughs> and, and, and you do own the fastest Bellator females knockout. But Anger Fist, where, 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 how, did you, how did you come up with that name? I like to think it's my alter ego now because, yeah, it's funny. A lot of people, especially, um, you know, who follow me on social media or, you know, Anger Fist is probably a little bit of a um, scary sort of name. Even people that see me in public but they're too scared to come up and say hello, I'm like, surely I look like a nice enough person. But, yeah, I guess it's um, – it came from my amateur boxing days um, just from a flight song that I walked out to. And then I just didn't really do much with it. And then obviously once I turned professional, it's like, oh, you need, like, kind of need a fight name. But um, it didn't really stick until I started MMA. And obviously because I come from a boxing background, you know, it's my hands that do the talking. And, yeah, Anger Fist just sort of stuck from there. Um, as I said the other day, I, I was thinking about rebranding a few years ago because Anger Fist for, um, yeah, like a fight name and, and marketing for life after fighting doesn't really sound too appealing to organise, you know, Made motivational talks at schools and, um, you know, women in business meetings and stuff like that, you know, Arlene Angerfist Blanco, it sounds a bit a bit, um, a bit of a put-off or scary or people might have like a, um, an idea of what type of person I am before even really meeting me or hearing my story. But um, I kind of realise now that, you know, if people reach out to me now, it's, they already know most of my story. And another reason why I'm doing more of these podcasts too is just to get more of my story out there and, um, yeah, sort of break down that anger fist scariness a little bit <laughs> and you're going to write a book at some point for sure that's that's i saw that somewhere yeah, as well so yeah. um so we'll, we'll start to wrap it up yeah. um this fight is 100 percent going ahead 100 percent locked in so i mean obviously you've got to do your covid test that's probably yeah. the only thing but you've been able to get the exemption already or yeah, and yeah. stuff yeah. how how hard was it to get the exemption um well I was lucky. So Bellator, um, their legal team, you know, put a letter together. I, um, you know, obviously stating, you know, my ranking, what I'm doing. So it's not like I'm just going over there for like, you know, a little fight or something. You know, it's for the Bellator world title. I'm representing Australia. So, yeah, they put a very uh, well-written letter together. Um, and then I also attached my fight contract with it. So um, obviously put the the exemption, applied for it online and linked um, – Jamie and my partners to that um, and mine actually came back and got approved but they got denied and I was like oh okay <laughs> so I was like oh no I'm gonna okay, I'll be flying over without coaches but I'm like hang on a minute no I'm not going over without coaches it's like a football team going over that with you know without their coach or without half their players or something it, it's just yeah so I actually reapplied Bellator rewrote the letter um, on behalf of Jamie and um, Dion just stating that obviously you know they're my trainers and I need them there. So, yeah, I think whoever obviously processed the first one probably just didn't really realise that, okay, she's a fighter and she needs the coaches and, and that. But anyway, it all got approved. It was a bit of a process. Um, you know, you need your documents and your reasons. But, again, I feel like I'm very, very lucky because I know that they are rather strict with the exemptions and people are getting denied, you know, travel exemptions, you know, for purposes of funerals and, you know, more personal type things. So I kind of – I feel bad that you know, I'm going over for a fight you know, the idea of someone missing a family member's funeral is just, you know, so sad and, um, yeah, I, f I do feel Which really is bad. weird because yeah. they do they do try to sell it that you get the exemption for compassionate grounds. Yeah. 
yeah, a funeral would be a compassionate 100%. ground. Like this is what I'll never understand. Yeah. Like I really don't understand. And then you know, as I say, I mean, you've got a title fight, but I mean, even like last week, the 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 Australian cricket team went across to England yeah. to play a game of cricket, right? Yeah. Like, and it's kind of like, uh, yeah, as you say, like you've got families that have lost family members yeah. and they're getting denied. Yeah. Um. But yeah. So what's the 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 protocol? So you get tested here. No, Before so you leave or no? No, so we fly over and I get picked up from the airport in a private vehicle, so um, my team and I, so we're um, you know, segregated away from anybody else. Um, we get taken straight to the casino hotel where I'll be fighting and we get COVID tested immediately and then locked into our room and quarantined until those tests come back negative. And then from there we're allowed out, um, face masks the whole time, but only in the areas of the casino um, that are quarantined off by Bellator. So it's not like we can go into the, you know, the, the pokey area or like the, the public areas where the, I guess all the people will be. But from what I hear, um, you know, Connecticut where the casino is at is actually in lockdown. So I think it must be like a very much like, you know, Victoria situation at the moment. So um, just talking to other fighters, you know, who've been over there just to try and get a feel for, like, what's happening, um, how it is, so we can be a little bit more mentally prepared that it's going to be completely different to any other experience that I've had before with Bellator. And then you're going to have to obviously do yeah. two weeks when you yeah, get back, yeah. right? Yeah, so we'll literally, um, you know, fight on the Thursday night, which is Friday here because you lose the day. Um, so Friday there we'll be flying, so I'll get back Saturday and then, yeah, our two-week quarantine will start. Um, yeah, so just thinking I've got a list of things. I've got a list in my phone of things that I'm going to do in that time. Like I've already had to quarantine for two weeks when I got back from America. I was lucky enough to do that in my house. Um, so I've got a gym and a kitchen and did a lot of organising and cleaning and training and that. But, yeah, I've got a, a list of things and I'm going to be very active on my social media, do a lot of live, um, like, you know, chats and, and, and bits and pieces and try and include a lot of people in that. And I've got a sports webinar thing that I've just signed up to as well. So, um, yeah, just keep myself very busy. Well, the fact that you're bringing back the belt, hopefully they'll give you the Alex treatment because I think he, <laughs> he got put up in an Airbnb. He didn't have to – and with a gym and everything. Like, he yeah. didn't have to stay at the hotel. Um, but we will wrap it up. Um, I just want to get a couple of fight picks from you before we go. Mm-hmm. Um so obviously, we'll go with the most important one, yourself, right? How do you see your fight going? Um, I, I guess we can all agree it ain't going the distance. Like, <laughs> it, and, and I say that just because obviously the two fighters that are involved, I just yeah. don't see it because it's five rounds, right? Yeah, so yeah. I don't see it going the distance. But in your mind, how do you see this this fight play out? Well, this is something. So um, I've got sports psychologist on board um, from Jackson Wink and we've been working on a lot of um, visualisation, like, you know, going through the five rounds and all different scenarios. So, yeah, I guess for me it's a – it's a, and going off, um, you know, how I sort of start the fight, you know, if I'm going to be the aggressor or, like, if I settle into it or just, yeah, where the fight takes me, it depends on sort of what happens. MMA, it's crazy one. She might rush – me or she might come in and be a bit you know tentative she might come in and take me down for the yeah so it's either going to be a quick finish or we could be in for like yeah I think um like just going off my boxing session this morning too we're we're ready to settle in for the five rounds if we have to and I want to you know if I don't get a finish I want to like um completely outskill her um yeah which I think would be just as impressive like it's you know knockouts are always at you know, lucky punch type thing. Yeah, even like when you look, at, if you actually technically sit back and look at the Amanda and um, Chris Cyborg fight and watch it, like, yeah, it, it was just a, not a lucky punch, but it really could have ended either way. So for me, you know, if I was to go in there and do five rounds against, you know, pretty much the baddest woman on the planet and make her look silly, make her striking look silly, make her look desperate, I think that's pretty, pretty awesome. And you man- and mentioned Amanda Nunes. Yep, she's fighting the other Aussie. Yeah, I know that's why Megan was Anderson, right? So, oh. do, do, yeah. So, do you guys train yeah, together at all, no. or do you, do you, do you, do you talk to each other? And um, how do you see that fight playing out? Well, this is the thing. Um, obviously, Megan's in a very much the same position as me. Um, you know, we are the underdog. She is the underdog, but by no means can you rule us out. 
Um, yeah, Megan and I trained together, gosh, years ago. I think it was before my first Bellator fight. So, yeah, about five years ago. So, you know, she wasn't with the UFC yet and I was, uh, you know, only like coming up to my debut fight for Bellator. But, you know, we'll quite often message each other. And, yeah, Aussie's supporting Aussies and I'm, you know, a very big fan of hers and what she's done and, um, you know, the exposure, the fights that she's get. Like, yeah, she's getting the, a shot at the um, – I was going to say Bellator. No, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> the UFC world title. Like, that's awesome. That's just – yeah, it's – um, you know, people are obviously excited about my fight but, yeah, excited about that one too. So – um, she's a very tall girl. Um, you know, Amanda, I think, was exposed a little bit against her fight with Jermaine, as in, um, like, fitness-wise. And, um, you know, there was a couple of moments in there that Jermaine sort of, like, you know, potentially had it over her. So, I mean, yeah, it's a fight. All it takes is that one punch or one slip of focus by, um, you know, Amanda or Chris and... We're going to capitalise on it. So hopefully, yeah, 2020, Aman- um, I was going to say Amanda, Megan and I both be two Aussie champions and, yeah. And and, and the thing that people don't realise is that Aussies are very laid back in, in the global sort of sense, right? They always yeah. go, oh, yeah, Aussies are cool because you're laid back. But we also love a good underdog story. So oh, the fact that you're both underdogs, I think yeah. that kind of fuels us. That's That plays right into our hand. Not to mention, and this is just a cheeky little plug, being the underdogs, you'll probably both be fighting, uh, fighting out of the blue corner, which is crazy, right? Like, <laughs> I, 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 I have to say that. But, uh, I mean, look, we, we've, we've done so well now. Um, uh, let, let, I mean, we'll go New Zealand now. But yeah. the, the other fight, yep. Izzy, Costa, exactly. Exactly. right? Exactly. Um, we're 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 producing. I mean, Robert Whitaker just lost to Izzy, but like we've we've produced some really really good fighters, yep. and and I think you know whether it be cricket, rugby, we've we've got that sporting kind of as I say that mongrel in us. Yeah, and and we're not we're not afraid to be kind of like yeah we're the mongrels. Yeah. Um, but yeah, with Izzy and Costa, how do you see that one uh, play out? Oh, uh, yeah, I think Izzy's got it for sure. He's just he's striking. He's just focus and. Going to outstrike him, and I think it's going to be a bad night in the office for Costa. <laughs> See, I kind of feel the same way. Like yeah. everyone's talking about Costa's going to bring the fight to him, um, and it's kind of like what I said to you before about that. This fight actually is the perfect fight for you because yeah. she's going to want to keep it standing. And I kind of feel like the same with the Izzy Costa fight in the sense of Costa's going to bring the fight, but Izzy is a counter striker. Hundred percent. So it's His it's kind of way too quick. Right, so it's like, yeah, bring the fight. That's exactly what Izzy wants you yeah. to do. Like, it's it's kind of so. I kind of feel that Izzy. I mean, look, Costa's a big boy once again, scary dude. But I feel if it isn't for that one shot, I, yeah. I kind of feel like Izzy is gonna, you know, stick on the yeah. outside and yeah. kind of piece him it's apart. It's unfortunate that yeah, like I guess someone zero's got to go, doesn't it? So yeah. One's going to be forever stuck in the other's mind. <laughs> you know, you never forget that first loss. Um, Khabib versus Justin. Oh, man, I'm a big Khabib fan. I just love his wrestling and his on-ground mauling. <laughs> He's just, yeah, I, I'm a big Khabib fan. So it'll be cool to see him back in there. And obviously, you know, he's had a very rough um, you know, year, obviously losing his father and stuff too. So I, it'll be interesting to see, you know, how he – how his mental state is, you know, being there without his dad, which I think he was there. His dad wasn't in one of the fights anyway, wasn't he? He wasn't in the last fight. He no, wasn't, th- I'm not sure if it was the last one or the one before, but yeah, yeah there was one where he couldn't get the yeah, right the visas visa, or yeah. something. Yeah, but I mean, that's different to not being present to not being here in general. You know, it, obviously it's going to be a talk and it's probably something that, you know, um, insensitive interviewers will probably ask how he's feeling after his dad or, like, you know, one of those things. But um, no, It could I, actually put the extra fire uh, in him too, right? Yeah. Because like, yeah. I'm sure he's going to want to go out there and dedicate it to his father and yeah, stuff. So yeah. it can actually f- fuel him. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I'm sure he's a super – like, he's a very super focused sort of fighter anyway, so I'm sure he will know how to just push that behind him. But, yeah, no, I'm a big Khabib fan, fan so – um, I don't see anyone beating him, just like, you know, even Valentina and um, I don't see anyone beating her for a very long time either. Okay, we'll do two more. So um, Robert Whitaker is now fighting Kennedy. Do you, do you feel that Robert has turned a page again and he's back on the up or how do you, how do you see that fight going? Yeah, no, um, I reckon, yeah, Rob's going to be super hungry just to get his belt back. So I don't see anyone like, yeah, going to stand in his way for that. So, yeah. 
Okay, and then the last one that I'll and it's just because you know Alex has made a big statement on that he doesn't want the the Max Holloway fight anymore. He yeah. wants the number one contender, and they've now made the Korean Zombie versus Brian yeah. Ortega, and I kind of feel like that is the number one um, yeah. contender fight. Uh, who do you, uh, yeah? How do you see that fight going, and who do you think Alex is going to be fighting next? Um, probably the Korean Zombie, I think. Um, yeah. But either one, like, again, I've just, even spending time in front of Alex, like, he is just next-level fighter. It's crazy. Um, I don't think – I don't see either of them beating him anyway. So whoever – yeah, whoever's in front of him, he'll just, you know, have a plan and put it in action. He's a very, very switched-on fighter with a gas tank that goes four miles. <laughs> Beautiful. Well, that that's pretty much it, unless there's something that you want to bring up. Um, but – Look, I, I, I want to wish you the best of luck, not that you're going to need it, um, you know, and and it, it's amazing. As I said, yeah. you and Megan right now, and, and as I said, that we've had Robert, we've had Izzy, uh, Alex, like I just think we're in a really good spot right For now. Sure. Any, uh, anyone, you know, that's starting out in the sport, all these young youngins and stuff, it gives them hope because it's not unrealistic. It's, you know, we've even got Chelsea Hackett, you know, with the Contender Series um, – coming up later on in the year. But, yeah, there's avenues there for the, the fighters to get overseas now. It's not unknown for Australians. And, yeah, the fact that we're on these promotions but we're also, you know, winning and, you know, competing for the world title. So, yeah, best show. All right. So uh, I always give people the opportunity. Um, if, if anyone wants to reach out to you, whether it's just someone that's a fan of your work, uh, someone that wants to support you, someone that might want to get you along to some motivational speaking or, yep. or, or whatnot, um, what's the best way of them getting in touch with you? Um, probably social media, um, Instagram. So I'm the Aussie Girl Anger Fist. Um, I promote myself as the Aussie Girl. Um, I used to just be like Arlene Anger Fist, but the Aussie Girl's kind of stuck now after, um, you know, fighting in America so many times and my accent's apparently really Aussie, <laughs> which you don't notice it until you're over there. But, um, yeah, so the Aussie Girl Anger Fist, um, send me a message and I'll always try and get back to everybody who messages. Well, there you have it. Um, a- as I said, like, uh, I couldn't be more proud of the mixed martial arts scene right now in Australia. Um, you know, best of luck. I hope everything runs smoothly. Um, you get over there, there's no sort of, like, problems with customs or whatnot. Um, and you bring back that belt, and then hopefully we can get you back on with the belt um, and have a little chat on, you know, what's next. But until then, I think we're going to call it a day, and that is it. I'm away. I'm away. Why?